So again, we want to thank the Montana stock growers for the opportunity to, to offer this uh, conversation tonight. Uh, as Kenny said, my name is Dr. Joe Gillespie and I'm the professional services veterinarian for Beringer Ingelheim representing the Beef Northwest, which includes Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Northern California, all the way around to Colorado. So uh, our conversation tonight will be with, with Mr. Lamar Steiger, who is a, a representative that is working directly with a large grocer. But before we get into that, I just thought I would briefly introduce Beringer Ingelheim as a company. Some of you may be quite familiar with us, some of you may not be. So what I'd like to do maybe is just who we are, um, Beringer Ingelheim is a privately held, actually the largest privately held pharmaceutical company in the world. It was founded in 1885 in Ingelheim, Germany by the Beringer family. And it's on its fifth generation doing business in over 150 countries. What's a little bit different when you have a family business is you can invest in what you feel is important, which basically for Beringer Ingelheim is three specific areas. It's human pharmaceuticals, animal health, and biopharmaceutical manufacturing. And in many cases, pharmaceutical companies, the animal health division is very small, five to 10%. In the case of BI, we're over a quarter of the company as a whole. So we are a very important part of that company. And what, what Beringer Ingelheim stands for as a company. And really, this is our mission and our goals. Uh, many people maybe know this, but our goal is to protect animals against disease and pain, help those who care for animals, and then ultimately go beyond medicine to better predict, detect, and prevent animal disease. So you can see the tagline along the bottom of my slide here where we're talking about putting cattle first. And ultimately, our goal is exactly that, to put cattle first. And we know you as producers are invested in that same goal as we look at creating profitability for you and your businesses. And that's what's led us to this conversation tonight. I think I have one more slide. This is just a, a look at some of our products that we offer. Many of you may be familiar with them. Uh, if you aren't, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the Urbier and Ingelheim representative in Montana. We have two of them, one in the east and the one in the west. But I'm going to stop presenting so that you can see more of Lamar and I. And just to introduce Lamar Steiger a little bit, he's going to tell us his story, which is probably way better than my brief introduction. But Lamar started out in northeastern Wyoming on a ranch with his family as a young boy because of some health issues with his father, they moved to Arkansas. And he grew up in Northwest Arkansas near the Bentonville, Arkansas area. Obviously in the production ag, both in dairy and in beef in his career, ultimately ending up operating Jack's Angus Ranch, which is still in operation today, along with his father-in-law, Jack. The secret behind Jack was that Jack was the first president at Walmart with Mr. Sam Walton. So for someone to be able to not only have a pulse on agriculture as a beef producer, but also have the opportunity to be in the loop or be in communication with people in the grocery industry, Lamar brings a great set of skills to this conversation. And I thought that I would just start with the fact that this is a great opportunity to touch producers and their support structure throughout the entire conversation today. As we think about the producers remaining re relevant in the future and the relationships that they have with the consumer ultimately, because we think that we have a great product today in the beef industry and we need to continue to figure out what our customer wants. And that's what our conversation will be with Lamar tonight. Again, Lamar, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. This is, I think, the third time we've had this conversation, and sad to say, it's the third time we've done it virtually. But uh, one of these days, we're going to be sitting on a stage somewhere having the same conversation. But uh, 
I'd just like Lamar for you to open for the Montana Stock Growers, just to tell a little bit about yourself and what's gotten to you to this point where we're having this conversation maybe in the last five to 10 years. Yes, uh, Dr. Joe, thank you so much. And Kenny, thank you. And I'd have to tell you that when Dr. Joe called and he said the Montana Stock Growers, I was a little intimidated because it's like, uh, it's not being at recess. You guys are the real deal. And it's an honor for me uh, to be able to share a little bit about what we're doing down here in Bentonville uh, with not only one of the most prestigious uh, organizations in the in the beef business, but but individually, I think uh, the the beef growers in Montana are some of the most important and uh, professional ranchers in the in the entire North American continent. So it's humbling for me to be able to share a little bit and and to tell y'all what I've learned uh, spending time with grocers and listening at every meeting to somebody around the the table saying, well, what is the customer telling us? What is the customer telling us? And I think. What we want to bring to you all is uh, a little bit of a reminder that it's ultimately all about the customer and whether they're at a steakhouse or a, or a grocery store or, um, or at, a, at a butcher shop somewhere in Boston, downtown Boston, it's all about the, uh, all about the customer. And so I, you're right, Dr. Joe, I was born and raised, I was born in Belfouche, South Dakota, but our ranch was at Hewlett, Wyoming, right in the shadow of the, the Devil's Tower. My grandfather had bought it way, way uh, early part of the century, last century, and my dad had grown up uh, going out from Wisconsin, where he lived, going out and spending summers at the ranch in Wyoming, and after World War II, he told his dad he didn't want to be in the rug manufacturing business, he wanted to ranch, and uh, so my grandfather made him go to University of Wyoming and said if he didn't get a degree, he would sell it, and uh, came back from, uh, from in the early 50s, late 40s, finishing college, and and, uh, and my dad, Don Steiger, was really one of the, the innovators, uh, early innovators in the use of artificial insemination. He was one of the, the first guys to get, uh, to get semen on uh, Simmental, Limousine, Charlet, uh, at least Charlet in the north. And uh, it was always kind of on the cutting edge. And I, so that's the way I grew up, is I always think, think what's next and what's big and what's exciting in the, in the business. And, and my dad's health, he, he stepped in an auger at a harvest store and and actually I was five years old and and I happened to be with him that day and I got the credit for saving his life and I won't go into that whole story but but his knee hurt pretty bad after after that he was lucky to keep his leg and and uh the uh the, his health and, and then also just some other things that were going on in my mom and dad's life that they decided to move to to Arkansas of all places and and I was just very young, and I look back with great pride at having that experience and being originally from the West. And, and like I said earlier, I'm honored to speak with true, true Westerners and true Montanans. And, and so grow, grew up here and went to high school with junior high and elementary school with my wife, Sherry. Her dad, as Dr. Joe said, was, uh, was president of Walmart in the 70s and the 80s for about 12 years. I think he was Sam Walton's right-hand man, and he's actually passed away but he, um, he's still a big influence, as you can imagine, in, in the way I think and what I do. And, and, uh, and so uh, having been with Walmart, he consulted all over the world after he retired. And one of the men that he trained was a guy named Greg Foran. And Greg uh, lives in New Zealand, or is from New Zealand, had his career with Woolworths Australia. And Jack trained him as a retailer and, uh, and mentored him. And eventually he became in the about 2014 became president or CEO of Walmart USA. And so I was having dinner soon after Greg came to the United States to take over the US stores. And, uh, and he said, what in the world is the deal with this uh, beef supply chain in the United States? It's the worst supply chain of anything we deal with at, uh, at Walmart. And we just had a brief 15 minute conversation and, and, uh, and I shared some ideas that I had about the the funnel that we have for the packing, the packing and plant industry and the harvesting industry and, and just how big our country is and how diversified our, our cattle herd is. And, and that leads to the problems with the consistency that Walmart's looking for and every other grocery store is looking for consistent product. And, and um, a day later, early on a Sunday morning, I got an email from his uh, assistant that said, hey, Greg wants you to come and give your presentation to the Walmart beef team uh, and Friday at, or Monday at, at uh, five o'clock. 
and I've never opened PowerPoint or, or <laughs> hardly do email. And so, um, and so I was like, I don't really have a presentation. And I went in and visit with them. My wife drew up the different boxes, the different squares of the supply chain on butcher paper. And I taped it to the wall and, and the guys that were there still laugh at me, I think about that. But that turned into a consulting contract with Walmart to help them reimagine uh, what, what, uh, what um, was probably a well-deserved bad reputation in meat, Dr. Joe. And so Walmart, uh, you know, originally some of us that are older will remember that Walmart was just general merchandise and they did not go into the grocery business until oh, the uh, late 1980s, they started playing with it, but didn't get serious until, uh, until the early 1990s. And by 2003 or something, they were the largest grocery store in the United States, no butchers. And, uh, and then, so they kind of brought case ready to the United States, which they were already doing in, in Australia. And that's where you have the, the plastic trays that are, that are in, the, in the stores instead of having butchers and the meat is prepared at a case ready plant and then sent there. And probably a pretty, like, a pretty poor reputation. And part of it was just when you grow that fast and you have a product that's not easily uh, remade in exactly the same way and you just have to get product on the shelf. And I think the guys that were running the meat business and during that time period were trying to do the best they could. But uh, as I mentioned before, we really didn't have the foodie, the foodie generation like like we have now since 2000. And and by the 2014, Walmart recognized that uh, that in order to win uh, in grocery, you have to win in fresh. That people a uh, fresh fruit vegetables and meat are really important to people, the new growth, the new shoppers, the next generation of shoppers. And so that kind of laid the table for my uh, consulting with Walmart. And I'm, I'm not an employee, I'm a consultant. Uh, my wife and I have a 500 acre ranch up in Missouri and run Black Angus uh, cows and, and, uh, and I consult in retail and I also consult in uh, philanthropy and generosity with churches. Well, very good. So I, you brought up a great point, and I think that's something that we, you and I have talked about before, but is that that concept of case-ready meat and what, what consumers are telling Walmart when it comes to buying purchases, you know, their, their patterns of purchasing and, and what that all looks like. Maybe you could share a little bit about that, because I think that's worth us telling that story. Okay. Yeah, we... We uh, or I have been able to go behind the curtain at Walmart. I grew up right here in uh, in Bentonville, and I uh, and I've known all the CEOs, including including Sam Walton, and uh, and I've been uh, able to be a part or at least watch from the sidelines Walmart's phenomenal growth, and and uh, they're just really they're just good people. And like when those guys were building that company, they they had no idea they were going to be the biggest company in the world. They were just trying to. Uh, do the best they can by their customers. And that was save money so people could live better, spend less on stuff so that they could live better. And, and so when I got behind the curtain and just got to really sitting there and listening to just, just how smart this team is, Walmart's beef team is made up. There's several meat scientists, Texas A&M guys, and, and um, Ryan Stackhouse has a meat degree from University of Arkansas. Uh, there's just really smart meat guys. And just the fact that they would hire, uh, you know, meat scientists instead of just uh, rotating some other buyer over to meat, uh, you know, they're really interested in doing it well. Uh, when Walmart does a test, I mean, you're, it could be a 40 store test, which is larger than, you know, many, many uh, grocery chains. And so there's been different times since Walmart really got actively involved in trying to improve their supply chain that they've tried all kinds of different things. Like for instance, taking the cap off of the ribeye because of uh, the size of the ribeyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is something that we've, we, I've thought about a lot is I can't get my mind around ranchers are paid by the pound. And it's really important that we have a lot of red meat on these cattle. And so we're selling these bulls with these big ribeyes and yet the grocery stores, not necessarily the steakhouses, but the grocery stores need a ribeye that they can cut an inch thick that uh, consumers can afford. 
And, and that's not just Walmart. I think most every grocery chain, almost every grocery chain is worried about value. Uh, very, very few of these grocery chains are so well loved and respected that they can just charge anything and have ridiculously high prices. But if you want a ribeye an inch thick so that somebody cooks it properly, it can't be 16. It's, it's got to be down around 13, 14, something like that, so that the, 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 so that the price point is something that people can, can, um, can, can afford. So they tried 40 stores, I think uh, 45 stores of taking the cap off and consumers walked away from ribeyes and they went uh, to pork chops. And so Walmart can tell with their sophisticated systems, they can tell immediately when something drops and then they can tell when something goes up. And if it's a trade-off protein like this, then, uh, then they, they really know and they, they drop that test pretty fast and it might work in a restaurant and it might work in a butcher shop, but it doesn't walk, work at, at large grocery stores. The consumers didn't recognize it and they didn't want it. Uh, you know, you and I have also, I think, talked about uh, the chuck and uh, the way that the chuck roll is trimmed and the way that it's cut at the, uh, at the, at the uh, abattoirs or the, the packing plants uh, more and more and more, these chucks are coming out and they look like great big steaks, but they're chuck roast. And if, if the Walmart grocers can get the packers to cut it in such a way that it looks like a chuck roast, uh, I was in a meeting the other day and one of them just said, you know, we sell a thousand more chuck roast a day if it actually looks like a chuck roast. And so there's the constant tension between what the packers are doing for their bottom line, what the grocery stores are doing, and then those of us on the supply end are like, well, like, what do we do? How do we solve these problems? And I just am so proud of this company that they are investing in a supply chain that we can talk about just here in a second, but they're investing in a supply chain because they know that consumers are demanding certain things and they're just not getting it in the, in the existing system or as, as Greg called it, that the, the most dysfunctional supply chain that he, that he had. And so we, um, we have some issues, some, some pretty strong uh, issues in our industry, as, as I guess every industry does. But one of the meetings I was in, uh, if you'll allow me to tell a quick story, is one of the meetings I was in and they were just talking about just like how many different, um, different issues and challenges the beef industry has. I was reminded of a of a story of quail hunting with Sam Walton and Jimmy Carter and my father-in-law, uh, Jack Shoemaker in South Texas. And, and, um, and normally uh, things are pretty uh, low key and pretty relaxed down at, uh, down at Mr. Walton's hunting ranch. But with Jimmy Carter there, there was you know security and all that kind of stuff. And people were a little bit on edge. And I don't think they had too much confidence in my father-in-law, Jack. Uh, he was a pretty aggressive hunter. And so they they made us go over to a different part of the of the field that we were hunting in and we looked over and there was a the the secret service had sent us away and and there was kind of a little something going on and so we took the shells out of our gun and walked over where Mr. Walton and Mr. Carter were and and Mr. Walton one of Mr. Walton's dogs had gotten under the uh, a thicket and had been bit by a by a rattlesnake and uh, Walter who was Sam Walton's ranch manager he looked like John Wayne, he acted like John Wayne, and he loved it when you told him that you, he reminded you of John Wayne. He uh, had pushed his way into this thicket, you know, with those big old South Texas thorns, and, and he found himself standing on, on uh, one foot on the head of the rattlesnake and one foot on the tail. And, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Walton was, uh, took his glasses off, and he was like, well, now, Walter, you jump up, and I'll shoot that snake. And and Sam or Jack was like, whoa, now, Mr. Chairman, like, like, we don't need you shooting in there with Walter. And so Jack had a great big long knife on his belt. And he went into that, uh, to that thicket and he cut and he cut the snake and killed the snake. And we drugged the dog out. Unfortunately, we lost the dog. Uh, that night at dinner, uh, the dog actually passed away. So uh, that night at dinner, we had this really uh, typical of the Walton family kind of uh, luxury catered meal, which was probably Mexican food on card tables with, uh, with uh, pieces of uh, short sticks of wood that were for the fireplace was probably our seating. And, uh, and Mr. Carter and Sam and Jack and Walter were down at one end of the tables and they had five or six card tables set up. And of course, I'm the youngest guy on the trip. And, 
and the lowest ranked person on the trip. And so I'm way down at the other end, but we're all trying to listen and to this conversation because it's not every day you're with the former president, right? And, and um, Jim, Jimmy Carter says to Walter, he says, hey, um, uh, what were, just what were you, Walter, what were you thinking when you were, when you were standing on that rattlesnake? And Walter leaned back and crossed his legs and he spit over to the side and he said, whoa, Mr. President, you just don't do your best thinking when you're standing on a rattlesnake. And, um, and that line uh, was repeated often in the years following that by my father-in-law talking about the challenges that Walmart was going through at that time. But you and I've talked a lot about the challenges, the rattlesnakes that the beef business is up against right now. I saw Parade Magazine on, on, uh, on Sunday uh, and just this little blips about how to treat the planet better. And there was a square thing in Parade Magazine that said that magazine that comes out every Sunday that said, hey, treat the world better, skip meat on Monday, meatless Monday, no debate, no facts, no nothing. It's just skip meat on Monday, meatless Monday, they called it. And it's just, uh, that's one of the rattlesnakes that we have to deal with. We have the, the movement of the vegans and the vegetarians. We have the, the environmental people who just don't understand the value of grass and grazing, grazing the grass. We have, um, we have um, activists in every corner that just really don't understand our product. We have animal activists and on and on and on. And all of us individually on this call could probably name off two or three rattlesnakes that you're facing right away. And it might be just the local, uh, it might be your local uh, uh, authorities and how hard it is to get things approved and to get water systems put in or get uh, manage the, the, the water in the West that's just so short. And everybody, everybody wants a part of the water in the West, I know, and you guys deal with that a lot. So all of these rattlesnakes are creeping up on our industry and, and uh, we, we need to be doing our best thinking now before the rattlesnakes get any any closer to us or any any more up into our business and so Walmart's response and Walmart's best thinking on the meat business was they were they were listening to consumers and consumers said they want quality and consistency and that's over and over and over again that's what they say consumers recognize the word angus and we have to give so much credit to the American Angus Association and to CAB that that the just the job they have done the urban people recognize the word Angus and, and you know they don't recognize other breeds and other so a lot of the other really great uh, lines of cattle and attributes that different breeds have but they do for that and when you're Walmart you you really need to focus on what most people know not what just a few people know and so uh, so they recognize that you know uh, the program that Walmart ended up putting together for 500 stores is uh, non-hormone added it's not NHTC but it's a non-hormone program that seems to resonate with consumers of every of every price uh, range. Uh, there are there are uh, consumers who are really worried about antibiotics, but not necessarily Walmart shoppers. And so, uh, so the program that we put together is not uh, it's not antibiotic free. It's not a never ever program. It's a um, it's a program that um, uh, that is um, of course we everybody nobody wants to use any more antibiotics than they than they need to use, but they're gonna use what, what we have to use. And the Walmart shoppers through their insights and through their testing and all, they seem to be fine with that. And, and so then we also require it to be Angus sired. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, as I mentioned before, that's one of the attributes that the consumers want. And uh, so the program, I, if you're okay, I'll just go ahead and kind of tell what, what we ended up developing. Right as I was coming on as a consultant with Walmart, they, um, they were talking about just gathering up some some specs to raising the, the the tide of what they were ordering from their suppliers and and I got to be a part of those conversations and and uh, at that time in the mid 1910s or 15 whatever you, you call that age period is uh, Walmart had two programs they have a white tray white plastic tray that has um, has upper select and lower choice. And then they have a black tray that is upper two thirds choice and uh, Angus sired. And that's being supplied to all 4,500 stores at that time by, uh, by their, their suppliers uh, through the two of the four big packing plant companies. And, 
and uh, and continually putting pressure so that the 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 specs and the quality and consistency cons consistently came up. But they were still frustrated, and part of what they're frustrated about is the um, the uh, the the lack of consistency in the program in the in the United States meat meat industry. And when you're 4,500 stores, I mean, you can just imagine how hard it is to get to get thousands and thousands of steaks that are exactly the same size, exactly the same eating experience so that when a customer goes home, they have such a great eating experience that they come back and buy again. Because if they don't have a good eating experience, they either don't buy beef, they switch to pork or chicken, or they don't buy it back from, from Walmart or wherever they bought that. Um, and so uh, be, uh, one of the things that's happened in the, is, in just uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit is, is because of the improvement in the supply chain that you ranchers have done, Walmart is actually testing and has enough prime meat that they're doing a blue tray. Uh, they haven't announced it as a program. They haven't um, they haven't really even advertised it or or anything, but put it on the tray on the on the shelf. But if you happen to be in a Walmart and you see a blue tray, that's the prime. And so there's enough prime that they're even offering prime at a Walmart, which. I never thought in my lifetime we would see that. And that is just such a win for the American consumer. And, um, and so the program that we put together is I, I got to take the Walmart uh, meat team all over the United States. We went from Georgia to Oregon and, and flew around and visited with some of the most progressive professional ranchers uh, out there, some of which are probably on this call. And uh, we just got to say what, um, what do you th what do you, we what do you want the CEO of Walmart to know about the meat industry and just to kind of try to keep our mouth shut and listen? And we found, which I was not surprised, that ranchers really want to know what's going on with their meat, where it goes, and and just as much as consumers want to know. And they really good professional ranchers really want to satisfy the American consumer. So, um, so what we did was one of the trips we took was down to 44 farms at Cameron, Texas. And they're a large, fairly large Angus breeder. And we were halfway through the discussion when the owner, Bob McLaren, said, well, what, what do you all want? What does Walmart want? And let's do something big. And so on that trip, Greg happened to be on that trip and they shook hands and they said, hey, let's put together a supply chain. And, uh, and so Bob McLaren formed a company with some, a partner or two, I think, and, and it's called Prime Pursuits. And Prime Pursuits is the procurement company for a Walmart supply chain for about, it's supposed to be about 500 stores. And, um, and Prime Pursuits is procuring black, black hided cattle that are non-hormone, black, black Angus sired, not just black hided, but black Angus sired. Uh, they have their own IMI verification program and protocols to go through. And, and then those cattle are being uh, backgrounded at, I think, over 40 ranches from South Dakota to uh, New Mexico that are partner ranches. And then there's, I think we're up to eight feedlots that are feeding the cattle uh, from Nebraska to Texas. And, um, and then they're all being uh, harvested at Creekstone, uh, which is in South Central Kansas. And the subprimals are being sent to, uh, subprimals are being sent to a a, um, a, uh, a case ready plant that Walmart has built in Georgia. The most expensive part of shipping meat, prop, even more expensive than shipping live animals is shipping these trays uh, that have the cut meat in them and you can only stack them too high. And then you have to have a mother bag of, um, of, a, of some sort of a gas mixture with air in there. And then the cardboard box is only this big and, um, and they, they now are, they have plastic boxes that they're using, they're reusable, that are pretty cool. And they have to wash them and clean them up, of course. And, but shipping that uh, from Texas uh, to Florida is really, really expensive. So shipping the subprimal to Georgia and then uh, putting it in the case and then putting it out to the distribution centers in the stores at a shorter distance made a lot of sense and has since uh, been really eye-opening for Walmart on how much money you can save when you just just that little bit of trucking in the supply chain right there is significant, and, and every penny along the supply chain to Walmart is significant, and they look at every single penny. And every time I have a conversation with them or a Zoom meeting, I'm amazed at the level of detail that they are they get into with some really really well-educated smart people that are that are just drilling in on just the cost of 
the plastic box from A to B. And that, that's what their whole job is. And uh, in May, there'll be a label on this meat and uh, it, it's in the uh, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, I think a little bit way down in the Southeast, it's, it'll be called McLaren Farms. And there'll be a, a big uh, t television and social media campaign for McLaren Farms meat. Uh, COVID just, you know, as, as it has the live animal part of this business, it's thrown just a huge hiccup in rolling out this program. And frankly, just, you know, just keeping any meat in the shelves is, as uh, John Ferner, the current CEO of Walmart USA said that we learned two things. I was on a trip with him last May. He said, we learned two things during co the outbreak of COVID is that people want their toilet paper and they want their beef. And I was really glad to hear the second part of that. I think it's interesting that you bring that up because I don't know about you, but on social media, I saw lots of pictures of empty meat cases during the onset of Corona. And then they would pan over to the right and there was a little shelf of impossible beef or, or whatever that product was there. And that was not being purchased. And it just goes to show that we do have a product that's in demand and we have consumers that are demanding it and they and what we as as beef producers need to understand is what what that producer what that consumer wants and how we provide that to them and I know you've talked a lot about the the Walmart's model and I think that's great and I hear a lot of feedback from from producers well we're not Walmart and and and, and we don't know if we want to be with Walmart but I know in the conversations that you and I have had before, it's not about Walmart as much as it's about figuring out a relationship with your consumer to pull product through the chain instead of us trying to push it. Maybe expand on that a little bit, because I think we've had great conversations about that before. I am so excited about all the different supply chains that people are working on all the way from the farm to table Thing where people are, are, are buying halves of meat uh, in places in the United States where they haven't done that since the invention of refrigerated train cars, uh, where people are actually going to the uh, small farmers markets and all, all the way to, um, you know, it's just every quarter we have a new uh, release of a new, a press release of a new packing plan, a new abattoir being built somewhere or planned or remodeled somewhere in the United States. And and I am all for every supply chain that we can figure out with uh, red meat, real red meat. And it pleased me to no end when we were in stores in June last year and there was no, no meat, but there was impossible burgers and all those kind of things that people, uh, people were, were not buying like they're buying beef. So the people want beef. They still want beef. We have a lot of issues to overcome. We've got to figure out how to how to, how to produce carcass sizes that have tons of red meat, and not as much fat and smaller ribeyes. And those are things that I think we're gonna to get to with genetics, but customers are demanding all these different supply chains. And so I don't shake my head or roll my eyes at any point when anybody tells me about an idea for a supply chain that they have for real, real red meat. And so uh, what um, I think the last time we talked, I was just been out to Arizona and visiting with a grocer out there. and. And so if, if Walmart is pushing really, really hard and has grabbed a hold of this one part of the supply chain, smaller supply, smaller grocery stores and, and other supply chains, they're, they're not trying to try to go right up against Walmart on, on price. They're not gonna try to go right up against Walmart on the same specs and everything. There are looking and there are talks all the time now. And now that Walmart's done it and, and Costco did it with the poultry where they reached yes. back into their own supply chain uh, for poultry that they wanted a certain way, uh, then, I, you know, we're going to see the dominoes falling and there is opportunity if there is a breed or a, uh, or some sort of an attribute like never ever, or whatever it is that somebody wants to produce. And uh, uh, I am just really a big believer on go find your customer and partner with them to pull that through instead of putting out a product and just being subject to what uh, whatever the market holds for that day. And I think that uh, more and more, there's going to be what I call like just digital cooperation or, or cooperation in supply chains. I uh, get the question at almost every talk that I do or podcast about um, uh, vertical integration. And, 
uh, Tyson is right here down the road, 30, 25 minutes from where I live. And I've witnessed uh, my uh, adult life. I've witnessed the integration, the, the vertical integration of the chicken supply chain. And, uh, and even a supply chain uh, for 500 stores at Walmart, the numbers, because of the amount of resources and grass and feedlot space and the number of ranchers that we have to work with and the number of things, those numbers were so big that this project had to go to the board of directors to be approved. And those executives at Walmart can do some pretty big things without going all the way to the board of directors. And so the numbers are just so huge that I don't have any fear about anybody getting a vertical integration in the beef business of any huge, huge, like 10, 20, 30% of the market. I mean, you know, uh, 500 stores at Walmart is still uh, in the big picture of things. It's still not a huge percentage of the, of the supply chain. And so uh, it's not totally vertical integrated. We, we are partnering, we're digitally partnering and trying to build trust with ranchers that want us, the Prime Pursuits to buy their cattle and Walmart and Prime Pursuits is dead set on treating people right and trying to do a good job by ranchers and listening to ranchers. I think our partners on the backgrounding are really happy and the feedlots, I've been visiting some of those feedlots and they're excited to be a part of something big and something that, uh, that is, uh, could be industry changing in the way that uh, grocers reach back and, and really can help all of us to know what to produce that the customers want. And, you know, I guarantee that the people that, that make this iPhone, they're listening to customers and they can make tweaks overnight and the updates and the software update and all that. And, and we do have a unique problem in that it takes three or four years yes, to, to make there. change. But I think we've proven since 2005 or really probably since we started doing DNA testing, I think we've proven that we can make change in the beef business pretty fast uh, in a decade or half a decade uh, when customers are, are demanding it. And you know, one of the things that customers are demanding and it's not the, it's not the government driven and it's not, some, it's not some organization driven customers, people that actually eat meat want to know where it comes from. And there is a mad scramble in our business from, a, from the correct point of view, I think, from grocers saying, hey, help us out. Our customers want to know where this comes from. And, you know, Walmart's beef is, is, is U.S. produced beef. And it is really, really hard for them to work on their suppliers every day, all the time, to remind their suppliers that it's a U.S. beef program. And that that's what they're asking for with their trays program, their trays. And so... Um, you know, the verification of that would, would be so much better for customer trust. We already have enough rattlesnakes that are biting at us. The last thing we need is beef eating customers to be wary about where their food comes from. No, and I think that's a great point because, you know, we look at technologies coming forward. Blockchain is a great example. You know, our limitation today is is not at the producer level, it's more at the packer level and differentiating those primal, subprimal cuts and primal cuts out. But still, I think you're correct in assessing that, that our customer is desiring to, to understand more and more about where their food comes from. I mean, there are organizations now that actually, that's their goal is to track where food comes from. I think that's the name of one particular organization it's looking at you know all natural and different things but but still the bottom line is that our consumer is asking for a supply and that that consumer size is still the general purchaser at Walmart and you 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 made something very clear to me tonight when you said that you know vertical integration isn't the direction literally Walmart is now trying to supply 10% of its top shelf beef. So that's not all its beef, just its top shelf beef in 500 stores across the country. And, and just from my advantage point, I, I frankly live in Western Nebraska where several of the feed yards are, it's, it's hard and it's expensive to put that many beef into Walmart just to supply 500 stores. And so I think the goal for us to have the conversation is not about well, let's align it all up and make it like the chicken farms. 
but it's to figure out what our consumer is asking for and continue because we have done a great job with technology and we've done a great job with genetics, continue down that path, but go down that path, understanding who the rattlesnakes are and working with them so that you don't get bit. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And, and uh, we're, it's just, it's just one program. It, it's fun for me. Uh, one of the things my father-in-law used to say, if you're going to be a bear, you might as well be a grizzly bear. They have more fun. And he was a, he was a big guy with a big personality. And, and it's just such a, such an honor for me. And I, I don't know, the, the Lord has just blessed me to be in the right place at the right time. The, the CEO of Walmart, I was the only rancher in the United States he knew. And he had just moved to the United States and that just put me in a great place. But I did have uh, both my father and my father-in-law were both innovators that wanted to see things get better. And my father-in-law, I mean, all he talked about his entire career was everyday low price, what the consumer wants, everyday low price, what the, I mean, I heard that, I heard that his entire career while he was at Walmart and Walmart is still focused on what the consumer wants. And, uh, and, you know, winning and fresh is really, really important with the, uh, the online uh, shopping. Like uh, my daughter gets most all of her staples uh, delivered through uh, walmart.com or maybe that other, that other big retailer called Amazon. They, she might buy from them, but I hope she buys from walmart.com. But uh, they, the trust level in meat uh, makes it that people still wanna go pick out their own steaks. On a Friday afternoon at a Walmart, you can go stand at the counter and I would suggest that guys do this. If you're in this business, go find a grocery store and stand at the, at the uh, unless they run you off because of COVID, but, you know, stand there and, and watch people, men coming in the store from three o'clock to seven o'clock, picking up steaks for that night. A lot of them don't know the difference. They know they want beef, but they don't know the difference in a, in a, in a, in a ribeye, a strip and a filet. I get calls and texts all the times from my friends. Hey, I'm at an expensive restaurant. Uh, what, what one should I order? And, uh, and that's our job as ranchers, I believe, is to do a better job of educating consumers. They want beef. Let's make sure they get the beef they want, the, the eating experience, and uh, let's, uh, let's uh, get it to them at a good value. I think that's very true. I think, uh, and you know, you've said all along too, it's the, it's the steaks that drive meat sales in Walmart. It's not the $1.99, 80-20 hamburger. Uh, it's not $1.99 anymore after COVID, but regardless, it's not the lost leader. It's the, it's the primal cut, but there is a point where that consumer won't buy that anymore. And I, I think we need to understand that as we, as we evaluate you know, what, what we're, we're thinking about in terms of genetics, how we efficiently put those pounds on them and, and, and produce an animal that can convert well, but also gives us the total number of pounds to be profitable at the cow-calf level, at the feeder level, at the slaughter level. And, and, and I think that's one of the things that's a great conversation for us to continue to have it is exactly that. Yeah, and, and the lessons learned uh, when uh, Walmart is or in the packing plant, they, they have their own supply chain. They're learning so many lessons. And I have to tell you is they would, they would be, if they were in this room, they would be, hey, we've, we've learned a lot. And we know that it's a really, really hard business. And when we get paid as producers by the pound and the, the consumer is telling us, hey, not too big. But yet on the other hand, I got to feed, I got to pay the bank and keep up with my mortgage and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I got to put pounds on and, and uh, but, but until we get started as an industry with some changes, and this may not be the change that some of the, a lot of the ranchers that are on this call want to be a part of, but maybe just be a part of something different than what, uh, than what we've always done. Because frankly, I don't think 20 years from now, American consumers are going to put up with much. They're, they're going to want what they want. And they're going to tell us. And I know there's a lot of seasonality to it that we have a hard time with as well. 75 or 80 percent of our beef is is slaughtered in April, May, June, and that beef isn't fresh if we don't manage it specifically. So understanding that and creating an opportunity there as well might be a different avenue for producers to think about as well. Because I know that's one thing you and I've talked about a little bit 
and I'm sure that will grow as this program grows, is not only are you uh, working with a group that's offering a supply chain to you guys, but also they have to figure out how to bring the number of cattle or the number of, of, of cuts to you at the right time. And again, that creates another variation that it's about that niche market and how do we find it and how do we convert it. Whether you're doing a large scale like this or you're doing a farm to table, uh, farm to table custom frozen beef sent around the country, probably 70% of it's between Thanksgiving and, and the new year. And that's not a good time either. So, so managing your flow and how cattle come through begins to be a question that we need to consider and how we market them. And I think all things that is just a good conversation for us to have. Yeah. Yeah. For the grocery buyers to now not just pound the table with their suppliers and say, we need this many ribeyes at Labor Day. We need this many ribeyes. Now they're a part of understanding just how hard it is to yeah. get that many ribeyes. Rib at Labor Day. And exactly. it's, it's not easy. And you're trying to slow down these feedlot cattle or speed them up or you're, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, been very, uh, it's been just so such a great deal for me to be a part of watching that because I'm not an expert in any part of it, but I've been a part of the edge of it in the purebred business and cow calf business enough to know some, and then to get this behind the curtain look at, oh my gosh, this just, this is really, really hard. Yes. Yes, it is. And I think I, I think that's a great example of how starting a conversation at one level over a dinner table can lead to a whole different approach to building a market around a great product that we have. And so what I would close with tonight as we think about uh, the producers that have joined us tonight is don't be afraid to have that conversation and to think about working with your neighbors, working with your local grocer, working in, in any way you see that you feel comfortable with to evaluate how do we create a better market for our products and how do we develop a better situation for beef and, and keep pushing fresh meat because we know we have a product that the consumer demands and we know with this model that that can create success at a different level for many different producers. So again, the goal is to just think outside the box and begin to ask yourself, who can I work with and how can I work with them to make what I do better? And I think that should be our goal as we close and think about if we have any questions. But again, Lamar, I thank you for your time tonight. And I, I really do appreciate your story. Uh, one of my favorites every time is the story about the rattlesnake because we are literally standing on the rattlesnake every day, whether it's an environmental group, whether it's a consumer group, whether it's our own, uh, our own feet because of the things that we're obstructing in our own industry. And uh, we just need to watch out for those obstacles, keep avoiding them as best we can and keep working with the same goal in mind. And that's to bring forth that quality product to the consumer that that consumer wants. Yeah, and thank you, and thanks to uh, to BI and what your organization is doing for animal health. It's 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 vital, and it's important. And our consumers want the cattle healthy. So, yeah. Well, so well, that you're more than welcome, and thank you for listening. Thank you. I see we have one quick question. I don't know if we're going to have any else come in, and I we kind of covered this a little bit, I think, Lamar. But I'll put it up there anyway. Someone said instead of asking your producers to make a smaller ribeye, why not something with the excess cutoff? throw it on a skewer and sell it like the Brazilians do in sir to sirloin. And, and what I think you told us before was that sometimes that can backfire. Maybe the tip wouldn't matter, but if you cut off the cap, then it doesn't look like a ribeye and consumers didn't, they, they switched their buying preference because of that. So yeah. understanding that a little bit, I think is another thing that we just need to think about changing it too much, whether it doesn't look like a chuck roast, it looks like a steak or you'd make it not look like the steak that they remember uh, changes their buying habits. Yeah, and there are some supply chains and some grocers probably with, with that have a butcher to explain it, that that would probably work. And, and I think that there are some that are probably making that work. Uh, the size and the scale with Walmart and no, no butchers in the store, uh, that, just, that just didn't work and they couldn't afford the hit. When they tried to take the cap off, they couldn't afford the hit on uh, on um, 
on uh, the low, people switching away, away from beef. But no, those are great ideas. And I, I just admire so much that that uh, a lot of this chains of stores and, and our and our culinary kitchens are just always trying to come up with something, something new. And I guarantee if customers want it, Walmart will buy it. They'll they'll would they'll be wanting it. They they put on their shelves what customers want. And it's really our responsibility as ranchers and people in this industry to create the demand. And you know, if if people move away from beef, Walmart will fill that cold shelf space with something else. And so I'm really uh, I, I feel good about the future. I feel like that we're finally getting our story out better about that we are good for the environment and uh, and I love it that we're trying to constantly come up with new products and new ways to do it. We need a, we, uh, you know, the story about the wings, chicken wings, and and like that was a, that was a product they chopped up and made dog food out of, you know, the wing. And now it's one of their most profitable. And we got a lot of parts on this uh, big big heifers and big steers that we need to figure out some excitement for. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Kenny, I, I just, on behalf of Bering Ring, Ohio, I want to thank the Montana Stock Growers Association for allowing the opportunity to have this conversation. I'm, I'm super excited that you recorded it and shared it on Facebook Live so that, that your producers can watch this anytime because I think just having the conversation is what the goal that we have. And I know that Lamar feels the same way. Our goal is to put cattle first and make cattle better. And the same with what they're trying to do with their cons consistent supply and, and, and what they're doing in terms of marketing. So we feel like that groups like the Montana Stock Growers Association are vital to that. Uh, I think Lamar phrased it best at the beginning. They're intimidating because you're like number two to the NCBA. So, so just great producers, great thinkers. And we want to make sure that everyone is starting to have that conversation wherever it fits in their production system. Yeah, well, thank you guys for presenting and spending some time. And thank you for all of our attendees for joining us. We will have this on Facebook Live. We'll put it on our YouTube channel and on our website as well. So we can always go back and look at it. Um, and yeah, thank you again for BI for just sponsoring this and being a great partner with us as usual. Yeah. Thanks, Kenny. Appreciate it. Lamar, again, have a great evening. and appreciate all your support. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Great. You bet. Thank you.